All right. Well, good evening. Welcome back. Uh, we're returning to our Ezekiel Bible study. Uh, tonight we are on Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9, uh, and we're going to be studying uh, about secret sins and a uh, vision that Ezekiel has. Uh, before we do that, though, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to come back together again tonight and study your word. We ask, Lord, that you'll send your spirit to be with us, be with those who uh, will watch this later and those who are traveling and may come in late as well. Lord, send your spirit to be with us and guide us in our study. We thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so secret sins. Um, of course, here, when you when you think of secret sins, now I don't, don't start spurting out what the sins are, but what what comes to mind when you think about secret sins? General terms, not specific details. Something you don't want anyone to know about, something you uh, like try to keep in a closet, kind of ashamed of. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're going to see um, tonight uh, where there's a group of people who are doing things behind closed door, um, not out in front of the general public. Uh, but as a result of it, though, they're leading all kinds of people astray. So but we're going to get into that. So let's. There we go. Start with the text for the night. This is found in Ezekiel 9, 4. It says, and the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof, Ezekiel 9, 4. That font is just a little hard for me to read. So here he's telling Ezekiel to go through the midst of the city where he's at. Remember now he's in captivity at this point. And I'm assuming he's just putting the mark on the heads of the men of Israel. Because I don't think the Babylonians would appreciate that. <laughs> and, and it says here that sigh and cry for the abominations. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. All right, let's first talk about apostasy. Uh, and of course, I kind of give it away here. I say gradual apostasy. And it says here, why do God's people, whether as individuals or as a corporate group, seldom if ever apostatize suddenly? I mean, have you ever, have you ever seen a whole church just all of a sudden just off the rails? Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen that way. It's a gradual process, right? And then the, uh, the next question asked here, why are believers in God prone to black backslide from him? I think that one's a little bit easier to answer. Um, the first one, as far as why doesn't it ever happen suddenly? You know, why does it take time? I think if it's too obvious, there wouldn't be, they're being asked to do something. Most people or church are kind of like questioning. Mm -hmm. Whereas they it's not sudden because they they it's just a little bit one one little broken one here one little broken one there one little step back here oh this is okay this fine it's a gradual building back and then that also right yeah if like it's too obvious that some, that something's wrong most people are not going to be yeah yeah we know <laughs> we know the condition that Israel was in when they were carried away into captivity we read about that we're going to see some more things that are going on behind the scenes tonight but uh you know they didn't go from just you know having the daily sacrifice to let's put our children on the altar right they didn't just come in you know you know Sunday evening they're doing the nightly uh sacrifice of lamb you come in on Monday and they're putting children on they didn't it wasn't like that it took time for them to get there uh, if someone had tried to do something like that, they probably would have responded violently against that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you can resist it, which for them is pounding you. Yeah, and they get you little by little. It says, uh, once, you, once you start compromising, compromise is a slippery slope, and it becomes easier and easier to slide further and further down and harder and harder to climb back up. Um, but yeah. Now, why are God are uh, God's people prone to backslide from Him? Why is that just seem to be the case so often? Well, the influences for one, mm -hmm. and second, uh, 
it's by faith. And that's difficult to maintain in our human yeah. situation. Sometimes uh, our, our, our faith is not always at the same level. It, you know, just like our, I don't want to say our personalities, but, you know, we have good days and bad days. We have ups and downs. Yeah, a couple troubles that come and go. Yeah, and so, you know, we'll be strong in the face and they start wearing away at us. You know, it's like the um, the rocks at the seashore. The waves just pound and pound and pound and gradually wear them away. And you can see those rocks, how they, they used to be jagged. Now they're all nice and smooth. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's the same way. It just, that gradual wearing down. And, and if you're not constantly on the look for that, and taking actions to build that up, then the natural uh, inclination is you're just going to wear away. I, I, that's one of the reasons I think coming to church is so important. Because all week long, it's wearing down, wearing down, wearing down. If you don't come back and get recharged, then, you know, one week you're up here, the next week you're here, and the next week you're here. And you just, it's a gradual drop until all of a sudden you, you don't even think about going to church anymore. And you're doing all kinds of things. All right, so let's dive in. We're going to start in Ezekiel 8. As you can see from the screen, we're going to be in Ezekiel 8 and 9 this week. Uh, we're going to look at two texts. Yeah. Well, we're not going to be just in Ezekiel. <laughs> yeah, Jerusalem 7. You find that in your paper? I think I fixed that on the slide. We'll see. Yeah, it's Jeremiah. Yeah. All right, so let's start Ezekiel 8, 2 and 3. Uh, we'll start this table, go around, and then I'll end with Carmen. Two points yes, yeah. So, Diane, if you can do Ezekiel 8, 2, 3, and then I'll have Rodney read Ezekiel 1, 26, and 28. Compare those two texts. Then I looked and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man. From his loins downward, there was the appearance of fire, and from his loins and upward, the appearance of brightness, the appearance of glowing metal. He stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by a lock of my head. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes, yeah, which provokes to jealousy, is located. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's compare that to Ezekiel 1, 26 and 28. It's Huh? 26 through 28. Isn't that what I said? Uh, 26 through 28, yes. And above the throne that was over their heads was the likeness of the throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above the continent. And I saw as the color of anger, as the appearance of the fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bowl that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell upon my face and heard a voice of one that spake. So, two questions here. First, who is he seeing in the vision? Who is this person that he's seeing? Said it resembled a throne. Hi, yeah. So, when we studied Ezekiel. Jesus. Yeah, God. Yeah, we we're assuming that's God the Father because He's sitting on the throne. Yeah, well, it's a vision, so it's oh. yeah, it's a representation. I don't think God actually showed. I imagine He probably could figure out some way to dim it, but it doesn't sound like He's dimmed it at all. He's just given him a vision of something that he would understand and recognize as representing God. And then the second thing, when he sees him in this vision, in Ezekiel A. He transports him to Jerusalem, but what's unusual about the way he does it? What did he say he did? They lifted me up between earth and heaven. Yeah, but how did he lift him? There's something very specific about what it did. 
took him by the lock of lock of my hair, snatched him by the hair. The Lord does some interesting things with Ezekiel. And I, I got to wonder when I read that, did the vision have sensations of healing to it as well? No. I, but when you think, why would he do that? Why would he do that in that way? I mean, have you ever snapped someone by the hair? No. No. They will. That's a non-committal, right? Maybe in the middle. Maybe. Okay. So think about when you're doing that with someone, why do you do something like that? Get their attention. Sometimes angry, yeah. There could be a little bit of anger in there. Get their attention. You get their attention, right? Carmen says to get their attention. So you think the Lord may be a little bit angry and he wanted to get his attention? Now, was he angry at Ezekiel? No. No, he's he's not he's not angry at Ezekiel here, but he's want to make sure that Ezekiel knows that hey, I'm about to show you something that is really making me mad. And uh, and he's gonna make sure you see it. He snatch you by the hair, you got no choice but to turn your head that way. All right. Now we're gonna look at Jeremiah chapter seven, verse eight through eleven. See, I fixed it. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 7, 8. That one's okay on your sheet. All right. Yeah, that's what I get for e emailing that out without proofreading it first. I go ahead, Nicole. Press the blood and words of the cat prophet. Will you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, because become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. All right, so a couple of things here. First, what building are we talking about here? Temple. Right. Yeah, does God refer to any other place as his house? Right. It's the temple. And who comes into the temple to stand before God? Priest. The priests, particularly. The people generally don't go into the inner parts of the temple. They have courtyards right. where, where they go into. Uh, but the priests go in to actually appeal before the Lord and to offer incense things that's all strictly priestly duty so he's talking here about priests who are coming in the temple and performing these abominations in the temple all right so this gives us kind of an idea here the question is what was the spiritual condition of god's people in jerusalem because remember at this point in time ezekiel has been carried away but he's seen a vision of what's going on in jerusalem at that point in time Were they worshiping idols where in particular in the temple so god's already let the babylonians come out twice and carry captives away and they're still worshiping idols in the temple all right let's go on uh carmen you can yeah. read this one jeremiah 7 12 through 15 okay um but go ye now unto my place which was in shiloh where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. All right, so a couple of things here you got to kind of catch on. First of all, what's he saying he's about to do to the, the temple there in Jerusalem? Uh -oh. Destroy it. He's going to cast them out of Jerusalem. He's going to cast them out, or in this case, they're going to be carried out. Um, and he gives evidence to prove that he's willing to do it. 
You know what he's referring to there? They said Shiloh. Shiloh, okay, so he's referring to, of course, the uh, tribe of Ephraim. Uh, of course, we know at this point in time, Judah is already, I mean, not Judah, um, Israel. Israel has already been carried away, right? Judah is about to be carried away, right? And at this point in time, Judah is smaller than uh, the nation of Israel was, right? Israel was had more tribes, but he's already carried all of them away. He's referring to, look, I let them be carried away, right? What makes you think I won't do the same for you? And now we can go back to Ezekiel 8, 4 through 6. And you ready to read, Philip? You still chewing? <laughs> <laughs> or through six. The whole glory of God was there. The condition was. And he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations of the house of Israel with us here? To make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abomination. All right, so we're talking here right at the north northern gate. The northern gate here, they have an altar set up actually at the at the gate of the temple where they are offering to other gods. And where there's going to be worse abominations as he's indicating this is just the first of the things he's showing you okay. all right now to ask the question what's significant about the prophet's awareness that the glory of god of israel was also there what was the one place where the glory of god showed to to man It was over. It was over the tent they had. Over the tent, all right, and then, then it was uh, in the sanctuary. It was over the ark, in the uh, the most holy place. That's a, that's the places where God would manifest um, His glory, and even then, only the high priest could could see it. But so here He's saying. The glory of God's in the temple, but he's he's leaving, right? He's being he says here he's being forced out by the uh, the abominations that the people are bringing in. Now, of course, we already talked. Who's bringing the abominations in? Priest. It's the priest, right? This isn't the common common people doing this. This is the priest. Now we know that the common people are also, you know, building altars and doing sacrifices and things of that nature. But here, the priests are actually doing it in God's house. All right, so now we'll come back up here to tie in. If you can pick up at verse 7 and read down through 12. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court, and when I looked, we pulled a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, now dig through the hole. So I dug the wall, and behold, an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing there. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things, and all the idols of the house of Israel, were carved on the wall. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel, with Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand, and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark, each man in the room of his carved images? For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. So interesting. Notice the imagery here. He sees a hole in the wall. The Lord tells him, dig through the hole. And then he finds a door, opens a door, and then he sees what's going on inside the sanctuary. So is this something they were doing out in public for everyone to see? No, it seems very, very clear that they were trying to hide this and that were, they were deceiving themselves into saying that God could not see it. And uh, 
it's as I mentioned earlier, you notice he actually names one of them by name. Remember, Ezekiel served for a time in the temple before he was carried off, so he knew some of these individuals. The fact that he actually names this one by name uh, was, was very striking. Well, as I said, when I was going through this, uh, preparing, this is the first time I realized that he actually knew the people he was seeing in the vision. Um, so here we have uh, the elders. So it's not just the priests. We have the elders. And it says they have on the walls, they've got carved uh, abominable beast, uh, every creeping thing. I mean, they have just totally defiled the sanctuary. So this is still a vision. Yeah. Still a vision. I mean, he's not actually at the temple, but this is what's going on in the temple. All right. It gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. All right. So let's go on now to verses 13 and 14. Rodney, if you can read that. He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, giving it to the Lord, and behold, there sat women weeping for the time with me. Yeah, just that. <clears throat> All right, so are we familiar with uh, Tammuz? No. The name sounds familiar, but no. All right, so it's, Tammuz was uh, sun god. They believe that he died in the winter and was resurrected in the spring, you know, so. And he was uh, evidently uh, related to the god of fertility, for obvious reasons. So here when the women are weeping, it's because... You know, the winter has come. He's died and he's gone away. Uh, but then they come back in the spring. Now, there are certain rites that they would do because they were so tied so closely to the god of fertility that, uh, well, I'm not going to describe them. But you can imagine uh, some of the pagan rites that women would do who... Uh, who were uh, worshiping gods of fertility in those days. And that was going on here at the temple gate, at the door right there, at the north entrance. Right. You can find more details on that if you read some commentaries on it. But, you know, for for our purposes, we I think we, we can all figure out what's going on. All right, so let's go down then to verses 15 and 16. And we see one more scene. I think it's interesting that every time he says, turn, turn again and you'll see greater abominations, he keeps, he's, you think, well, I can't get any worse than this. And it just keeps getting worse and worse. Uh, verses 15 and 16. Uh, I'll, I'll read this one because I haven't really read anything yet. It says, then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again. You will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. So when God laid out the temple... Had, gave instructions. He very specifically wanted the door to the east so that when they came in and worshiped, they had their backs to the sun because so many of the pagans around there worship the sun. And this is them, a symbol of them turning their backs on the pagan uh, sun worshipers. But here, they actually have their back to the temple and they are worshiping the sun, saying they are totally rejecting God at this point. Right. Now, this is the inner court. Now, we do have a text here in Joel. Just in case anyone is not clear on who these men are, we'll go ahead and read that. Uh, let's see. That's you. Okay, Nicole, I've lost place. Go ahead. Let the priests who minister to the Lord in the porch of the altar, let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. The nations should rule over there. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Right. Well, you see very clearly that it is the priest that go in between the porch and the altar. Commoners didn't go in there. That was priest only. That was their domain. So these people who are there between the porch and the altar who are worshiping the sun are priests. All right. So this brings us to a question. 
So we, we see a lot of idolatry going on in these images that we've seen so far. But, uh, you know, we'd say, well, we would never worship the sun. We're much too, uh, much too cultured for that or much too intelligent to fall for that. We know that the, the sun is just a big ball of fire in the sky. But what kind of idolatry is most likely to be practiced by Christians today? That's our first question. And then we answer that, and we're going to go to, do you think secret chair of sin is more damaging to Christians? I was to say Christina. I should say Christians <laughs> experience an open sin. Yeah, that should say Christians, not Christina. <laughs> Poor Christina, I'm picking on her. Yeah, all right, so that, that one I didn't catch. Spell checker, spell checker didn't catch that. All right, so what kind of idolatry is most likely to be practiced today? It can be anything. It can be your things you know, the things that mm -hmm. we watch, the things that we do, the lives we watch. Uh, yeah. The YouTube videos. There'll be bunches, right? Anything that takes priority over God is an idol. And today we have so many people are just pulled so many different ways by things that you wouldn't normally think of. I mean, like a nice car. Is there anything wrong with a nice car? No. No, absolutely not. It's good if you have a nice car. It's reliable. It can get you where you need to go. Get you to church on time every week. That'd be great. Right? <laughs> that would be awesome. But I know people. That car is their baby. Right? It is. Every day will fight you over a tiny little scratch on the car. But yet, you can curse the Lord in their face. When bad and I, they don't care. And they might even join in. Right. So things, uh, especially here in the West, Western culture, you know, we, we are very uh, susceptible to uh, falling into worship for things, but it could, could be other things. It could be career uh, people who put everything into the career. I mean, their families fall by the wayside. We know things like that cause a lot of divorces nowadays, but if their families are suffering, it's not just the families that are suffering, their relationship with God is as well. So anything. Uh, My cousins like a lot of saying years ago. Sometimes it's church that gets into the way of God. Yeah. Yes. Like, we're so wrapped up at what's going on at church. And we think we're supposed to. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, being there at every meeting and not the chief. So then, Blah, blah, blah. I'm getting wrapped up in the rules and yeah. Yeah, that can become uh, idolatry. We know at the time that Jesus came, the, the Jewish people were so wrapped up in the rules that they were worshiping the rules practically. Oh, we can't do this because it violates the rules, not because it upsets God. Right. And then they made more rules. Yes. Well, obviously we need more rules to govern those rules. Like, that's no, you know, and the people that, you know, the anti cheese people, this cheese, you can see the cheese laying right on top, yeah, and then digging carefully under the cheese to get a That's not going to work in my dish, there's cheese all the way through it. I mix it in. I mix it in. <laughs> yep. We bought. Huge show of it. You're going to be vegan, and you don't want the cheese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's easy to get a show. Yeah. Yeah, I will say, no, nobody's going to be cast into the lake of fire because they're not a vegan. And nobody's going to be walking through the pearly gates because they're a vegan, right? It's it's a lifestyle choice. Is it healthier? For, yeah. There's benefits to it. Um. But that's it. Uh, but yeah, so people people do get wrapped up in rules, uh, wrapped up in activities, get so busy being busy yeah. that there's no time for God. Yeah. I read um, I the person's name. It's probably good. I'm not saying their name since we're recording this, putting it on the internet. Um, but this lady was very involved in the prayer ministry at her church. And uh, she was going to speak at a conference. It was a woman, I will say that. And she realized 
uh, when she got up, she's getting ready to go out to speak that this was a prayer conference and she hadn't had a good time of prayer with the Lord in weeks mm -hmm. that she'd been busy. She'd been so busy. Busy preparing. preparing for all this and doing what and everyone thought she was all all wonderful and a prayer warrior and all that uh so she got up and confessed saying this to me i mean it's good okay you know 25 years ago or so that she said that to me and it just made a real impact so that god that church will can get just get in our way of yeah get so busy but and you see people who worship who worship the church, yes, not not God. Um, everything's all about the building, you know. I, there's people in Africa they meet under a tree, mm -hmm. and they have their service there. It's not about the building. Now I'm glad we have a building, because you know here it gets cold in the winter. I don't want to meet under a tree in January. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping up building, yeah. Now, may not, may not feel perfect, but paint, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's things we can all do, but yeah, but we don't worship the building. Um, so we, we know that it's, it's God. Now we do different things at the church. Uh, some of us do multiple things at the church, but it's not about the church. It's about God. That's the way it should be. Christians can get really, really sucked into that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think we've explained that pretty well. I'm going to get off this page before anyone thinks we're going to talk about Christina. <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. All right. So now at this point in the vision, God is going to uh, going to be making a move. North. So we already took him to the inner temple, right? Not well, not the inner temple. He was in the uh, the area between the altar and the porch. So he started on the outside, kind of worked his way around, and now he's in the inside. Uh, let's look at Ezekiel 9 now, because we've been in Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 9, 3. And Carmen, can you read this one? I think I skipped you on the last round. No, that's okay. okay. Ezekiel 9, 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. All right. So let's compare this now to Revelation. We're going to see he's going somewhere, and there's some significance here. Revelation 15:8. And then 16, 1. So that 15, 8 is the last verse of chapter 15, and 16, 1 is the first verse of the next chapter. So we can just read those two together. Do you want me to read them or somebody else? Are we back there now? Okay. The temple was filled with smoke, glory of God was God. No one was able to read the temple until the seven plagues and the seven angels were continued. Verse 1, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the mouth of God. That's right. So God has already told him that he's having to leave his temple. We see in Revelation when God leaves his temple, what does, uh, what happens? Mayhem. Mayhem. It says he pours out the vials of the wrath of God, right? So when God leaves his temple, it's a sign that God is about to send some judgment on somebody, right? So God is, when he says here that he's going to the doorway and he's getting ready to go out, then he's going out to execute judgment. So we're going to go back to the first verse in Ezekiel 9. Read 9 through 4 and then jump down to 11. And that'd be over here. Hey, right. thank you. Nicole's keeping me straight on where we are. So, Diane, can you read that? Ezekiel 9, 1 through 4. Then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, 
draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand. And among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case of his loins. And they went in and stood beside his altar. Then the glory of the Lord of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over the abominations which are being committed in its midst. Verse 11 also. Yeah, verse 11. Then behold, the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case reported, saying, I have done just as you have commanded me. All right. So let's talk about this here. There's some imagery going on. So the man in linen with the, the inkhorn is marking people. Now, who is he marking and why is he marking them? He's marking those who are upset with the scene happening at the temple. He's the ones who are not, who are still faithful to God. Okay. Yeah, because when there's, when there says here that when they, uh, how does it describe them? They sigh and cry over all him. Yeah, they they sigh and cry over the abomination. So are they happy about what's going on? No. No, these are people who are upset, but are powerless to do anything about it. Right. So it's like, uh, so we see things happening around us all the time that we're powerless to change. Uh, you know, we may speak out against it. People ignore us and we do what we can. But uh, as a whole, things don't change. And that makes us feel frustrated. Um, we may sigh. We may even cry, shed tears. So he's marking people who do not agree or approve. People who are against what is going on. So these are uh, people that he is marking as his own. Now, we know in Revelation, there's going to be marking going on. This is still a vision. This is still a vision. Yeah. It's not really him. No, these guys, there, there weren't six big burly guys with battle axes that walked in into the temple. Because I, I think if God was going to send six burly men in there with battle axes, they were going to do something. <laughs> They're going to clean house. This is a vision. But these men are waiting for the sealing to be done. And then when the sealing's done, we can see what will happen. All right, so now if we look specifically at verses 6 and 7, I'll read this here. It says, utterly slay, this is after everyone's been marked, right? It says, utterly say, old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So he's beginning where? Sanctuary. A sanctuary. So the first people he's going to be taking out are the people who's leading happened this apostasy so they began with the elders who were before the temple then he said to them defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain go out and they went out and killed in the city now we know that when the uh jerusalem was destroyed the temple was destroyed i mean the babylonians did go in and defile i mean they were bodies all over the temple they killed the people who uh, in their view were leading the rebellion there, which were the elders, the priests, uh, and those people. So all of that did actually happen. Now, in this case, it wasn't six burly men with battle axes. It was an army of Babylonians that God used to do that. Um, and I think we just answered the question here. What were the men to do with the weapons? They've done kill people, but not just anybody. It's just specifically the people who were not marked. Were not marked. All right. So we talked about this already. What does it mean to sigh and cry for all the abominations that were done in the land? We already answered that one, so I'm not going to go back to that. So I am trying to get through this uh, in one night. Are persons of a critical bent, here's a question, are persons of a critical bent more Christian than secret or open sinners? So think about that. Do we have people who make a show about sighing and crying about abominations? Yes. Yeah. So the, are they any more Christian than those who uh, may not be so vocal or people who are actually committing sin? Not necessarily. Right. So. And they're just 
distracting your there's to be something like that distract you from what's going on with the secret. So is someone the fact that someone speaks out against sin necessary is that automatically a sign that they are Christian? No. no. Okay. That's a good answer. All right, let's look at some some New Testament texts. All right, we'll go to Matthew 7, uh, 1 through 5. I think it's Rodney's turn. I mean, right? Rodney, all right. And then Romans 2, 1 through 3. That would be you. All right. And then we go back there in Carmen and a uh, Carmen and then back there. That's right. All right. That's why I bring her. Speaks for straight. There it is. I'm lost when she's not here. It's down. All right. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. That means that she did not judge. But with what judgment be judged, you will be done. And with what meant it to me, it shall be measured to you again. And why we hold the Son of the Lord in thy brother's eye, will consider it not obedient that is in thy own eye. For how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the bolt out of my, thine eye, and behold a beamness in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mold out of thy brother's eye. All right. And I think we've all seen individuals uh, who have gotten fame. We're going on like national television, right? And uh, saying how they need to take uh, people who are committing particular sins or, or crimes and just punished to the nth degree with with everything that we can throw at them. Uh, that's something specifically that God tells us not to do, right? We're not the judge. We're certainly not the jury uh, and definitely not the executioner, right? Now, we can speak out about the sin without judging the person, right? So we should never condone oh, condone sin, but we should also not condemn the person who's committing the sin. So it's it's a fine line. It's kind of hard uh, on our own because our natural instinct, some, somebody does something we don't like, we feel like we need to condemn that and condemn them. And that's not how Christians should operate. All right, let's look at Romans 2, uh, 1, through, 1, 1 through 3. Therefore you are... And where you are, where judge, and then you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Yeah. So I used to trouble about that when it says you who condemn are guilty of the same thing. And then I started thinking about that. You know, Jesus said, if you, right, if you uh, break one law, you're guilty of all, right? So it doesn't matter what the sin is. If you commit a sin, you're guilty of all the sins, right? You're just as guilty as a person who did that. So while our sin may be different, it's just as bad, Still right? There's no, there's no varying degree. Any one sin is enough to condemn you. So... You know, it's not a varying degrees. Well, I'm not as bad as that guy, so I'm good. Doesn't work that way. Right. So, you know, we need to not uh, be that person. It's okay for us to sigh, cry about sin, but we should not be casting aside the people who are committing those sins. Right. God loves those people too. Jesus died for those people just like he did for, for you and me. We should be doing everything we can to bring them to the light. And you're never going to win anyone to the truth by condemning them. Right? No one, no one has ever been converted because someone said he was such a horrible person. Right. Yeah, try that. Go to door to door and tell someone that they're a horrible, horrible sinner and then try to invite them to church. I had the unfortunate misfortune, I guess, of going door to door with someone who did that. I'm like, and I said, you know what? Let me speak at the next house. <laughs> Just let me speak. <laughs> Just let me. That was, it was a, a, an experience. All right. We're almost done. So all of this relates to us with the end time seal of God. We mentioned, you know, we've already looked at Revelation once. We saw it here in Ezekiel 
before God goes out to do all this destruction, he sent the man linen out to seal people. Right? I'm not going to read that again because we just read it a few minutes ago. But let's look at Revelation now. Revelation 7. Carmen, you want to read this one? Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Sure. Revelation 7, 1 through 8. That's a long one. And, yeah. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any on any tree. And I saw another angel asc ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to her, hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed, and a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nep Nephilim were sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Manasseh, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. All right. So a lot of numbers there. I'm not going to go in great detail of on, on the 144,000. Uh, if anyone would like more detail, we do have a couple of studies in our Revelation study on 144,000. You can look up on YouTube or Facebook page. Just look at our videos. It's there. But here he's sealing these people up before the uh, the judgments of the seven last plagues. They come out. Now, the 144,000, these are a representative number it's not a literal number it's representative of god's faithful people god's army at the uh the end of days uh, if you go back and look uh through history their standing army at any given time was divided up like this it's twelve thousand from each of the 12 tribes which comes up to one hundred and forty four thousand. right so it's symbolic of god's army uh, i'm not going to get any any more into that but notice here that he sees these people being marked for safekeeping until the final day of the Lord. That means that these people are not going to be harmed by the plagues that are falling, the judgments that God's sending. God is preserving them from those judgments. So the people who are at the end, are they going to have to live through all that? Yeah, yeah they're going to have to be lived through it. But do they, do they need to fear those things? No. Doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant, right? It, it's not, not, I don't know how he's going to preserve us through that, but it's not going to be a walk in the park. I can feel pretty confident in saying that. Right? But they will not be harmed by the judgment that is coming. All right. So now when we see here, Ezekiel saw just one group being marked, right? One group was being marked and the other group was getting slaughtered. Right. There's no reason, no need to mark them. He's just going to go through and kill anyone who's not marked. Right. In Revelation, though, things are a little different. We saw here we have one people being marked for God, but then in Revelation 13, I'll read this one because we're almost out of time. Revelation 13, 15 through 17. It says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So here we have people who are being marked, the mark of the beast. We already have people who have been marked with the seal of God or sealed with the seal of God. Verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And, of course, that's a whole study in itself right there. Yeah. We're not getting into that tonight. 
And then Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. So here's the ones that were sealed, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that so song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So notice there was 144,000 before. But where are these 144,000 now? Before the throne of God, right? So they're going to go through and come out the other end. Uh, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now here, of course, is talking spiritually. These are people who don't give in to the uh, adulterous powers. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they were without fault before the throne of God. And then verses 9 and 10, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So we see the two different groups. We had the people, like in Ezekiel's day, the people who were marked. These are God's people. Preserve them from the judgment. In the end of days, we're going to have everyone on the planet is going to be marked one camp or the other. If you're marked with or with God's seal, you'll be preserved through the plagues and you'll stand before the throne, right? As it says, the type of first fruit, these are the people who go through all of that. And the reason they can sing a song that no one else can is because no one else went through that, right? So it's a unique perspective that they will have. And then you have the other group at the end of time who follow after the beast. And those people are all marked for destruction, So in addition to Ezekiel's characterization, what other two traits are noted in the end time followers of God? And this is going to be where we're going to end it. Revelation 14, 12. What two traits we find noted about God's followers? Patience. Yep. Just two things, right? Here's the patience of the saints. It says here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It doesn't say anything in here about, and they're out there, uh, yeah, door to door, they're not out there telling people, uh, condemning people, judging people, right? Yeah. Condemning people for what they're eating. Is there any note of Jesus ever condemning people when he went to their house for a party? No. No, there's no, no, no condemnation at all. All right. So that... Takes us pretty much to the end. Ezekiel 8 and 9 got through it. Let's close with a word of prayer and then the choir can go off and finish my last piece of pizza. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the assurance we find in Ezekiel that, that you will act against those who have defiled your temple. You will act against those who lead others astray and that no sin is truly hidden from you. We also thank you, Lord, that we know that you will preserve your own. Right? You will mark them. You will keep them safe through the tribulation that comes. We look forward to the day, Lord, when we can all stand before your throne and sing that song in your presence, Lord. We ask that you will continue to be with us while we journey here on this earth, Lord. Be with us as we enter your Sabbath hours here and prepare for the service tomorrow. We thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.